Now, four reports have been done on what happened on the Hill that day and released on the shooting. But today, the focus was on uh, primarily the reports from the Ontario Provincial Police, which describe what happened on that day when Michael Zihaf Bebo walked onto Parliament Hill carrying a gun, killing Corporal Nathan Cirillo at the War Memorial, and then later when he was shot dead by police. And certainly one of the headlines today is that they had that chance and they missed him. I want to take us now to two of my colleagues who were on the Hill that day covering uh, the situation. Joining me from Ottawa, the host of CBC's Power and Politics, Evan Solomon. He broke the details of these reports, some of these reports on Monday. Hannah Thibodeau was reporting live on October 22nd as well. And Michelle Juno Katsua is a former CSIS agent and RCMP officer with more than 30 years of experience. Now, here's the way I'd like to uh, break this down, everyone. Uh, Evan, I'll get to you in a moment with what happened inside Parliament. And Michelle, once we hear what happened, we'll get some analysis from you. But Hannah, let's begin with you on what we have just learned about what happened outside of those Parliament buildings on October 22nd. Yeah, what the RCMP is essentially admitting to here is they missed the chance to even notice him. He was running up on Parliament Hill with his loaded rifle, and the RCMP didn't see him. It was only when a woman, a passerby, pushing a carriage, alerted an RCMP officer, that's when the RCMP realized there was a man running on Parliament Hill with a loaded gun. What happened at that point? She was alerted by the passerby, the woman with the baby carriage. She noticed that there was a man who was trying to take over a ministerial car with a gun. That car then took off towards her. She thought that car was going to ram her. Once it drove by, she gets on her radio. That's when she alerts her colleagues. However, the car that was parked in front of the stairs at the top did not hear exactly what was she said because we just heard from the RCMP that that transmission was garbled. But not only that, that car at the top did not ram it because they noticed it was a ministerial car. Mm. So you can see that there were a lot of opportunities there that the RCMP could have taken notice. They were in control of just the grounds of Parliament Hill at that time. Mm -hmm. However, there were some missed opportunities. And when Michaud was asked, what is one thing that would have changed the events or could have made things potentially different? And what he said, it was the chance when she went on to the radio that that communication was garbled. Mm -hmm. Had they correctly heard it, had that person uh, maybe potentially heard that, they could have rammed that car. But also the ministerial car gave him a quicker time frame to get to the top of the stairs. Because, Carol, listen to this. From the time that Michael Zihaf Bebo left the cenotaph to the time that he was on the top of the stairs, that time frame, one minute and 47 seconds. All right. Really so, fast. Okay. We just heard from Hannah on what happened in the outside and that they had this opportunity to keep, uh, to, to potentially take down uh, uh, Zahaf Bebo before he got into the Parliament buildings, but that did not happen. Evan, pick it up from there. So one minute, 47 seconds to get up there, as Hannah says. The RCMP, for whatever reason, don't stop them. There'll be a lot of questions about that. Now let's go to the one minute and 51 seconds. That's the time he enters the door, wrestles with that first guard, Sam Aaron's son, who we know the bullet goes off, ricochets off the floor and, and stays in Sam Aaron's son's leg. Minute and 51 seconds till he is killed. Here's what we now know, Carol. The security forces there fired in total 56 shots at Michael Zihaf Bebo. 56 shots. 31 hit Michael Zihaf Bebo. 25 of them missed. And there, there are some detail as to where those are. Here's how that exchange happened. The first, and then Zihaf Bebo fired at least three bullets at security, maybe more. Um, and there's a lot of confusion in this report, and we spent a lot of time at the technical briefing trying to get some clarification. One, he's confronted at the top of the stairs. We are told that Zihaf Bebo is hit as he enters the top of the stairs. So he wrestles with Sam and son, goes to the top of the stairs, and he's hit immediately by one of the parliamentary guards. Then he points his uh, Winchester 3030 uh, rifle at the chest of a guard, but for whatever reason, he doesn't shoot. He starts to sprint down the hall. We also heard that another guard shoots at him and hits him. 
So that could be twice he's hit, and according to the report that we were at, significantly wounded by the time he makes it to the end, tucks himself into that alcove, and that's when Kevin Vickers, the sergeant at arms, crawls around the pillar, and the RCMP, four of them, come down the hall. Now, there's significant detail what happens then about who's talking to who. Apparently, the RCMP yelled to Vickers. He's around the pillar. Then Vickers, uh, then Zihaf Bebo turns, fires directly at one of the RCMP officers. We know his name is Curtis Barrett. At that moment, that's when Vickers dives down and shoots upward 15 shots. The report details that he shoots right at Zihaf Bebo uh, from on his back, a number of bullets, then Zihaf Bebo falls to his knees down. Vicker sits up and continues to fire, and then Barrett comes over and he fires 15 bullets in. The final one is the headshot. Then he's, Zihaf Bebo is handcuffed. He's, then someone comes with uh, first aid. Then too late, he's dead. And then someone actually photographs him. Then there's a lot of talk about they try to get the prime minister out. Uh, but we also learn there, though, is the amount of chaos inside. Bullets are flying everywhere. You remember that one bullet that went through the first set of double doors where 80 members right. of the um, NDP caucus were? We now know that's a 9 millimeter bullet. That means it was fired by one of the parliamentary guards. All right. We also know one final thing, that a bullet went through the pant leg of uh, apparently an RCMP officer, but missed. So okay. it was a shooting gallery in there. Well, that's what it sounds like. So I want to bring it to Michelle Juno uh, Katsuya now, because Michelle, you, you former police off RCMP officer, CSIS agent, 30 years of experience. It sounds like it was chaotic on the hill that day. It is chaotic, and after the fact is, is we have the luxury to be capable to technically deconstruct a situation. But the officer under uh, uh, stress, uh, under the adrenaline, under uh, um, lack of information sometimes, trying to understand what exactly is going on, uh, are trying to do their best. And that's basically what uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Michaud was trying to explain. Uh, one uh, minute 47 or one minute 57. These are extremely short period of time and yet very, very long for the one who are mm -hmm. dodging bullets uh, somewhere, somehow. Well, let's uh, break it down a little bit, Michelle. I mean, that moment, a lot, you heard the reporters focus on it, where mm -hmm. the first RCMP officer dealing, the RCMP were first told by a woman with a baby carriage who was trying to, as I understand, get in the back of her car, diving for cover, saying there is a gunman on the yes. hill. Uh, she tries to alert her colleagues. What happened there? Yeah. Why didn't they hear the communication? I think, I think there's a mixture of a, of a lot of things. You've got suddenly a person who, quote unquote, assault your car, try to get into your car. That in itself takes a moment for the, for the members to try to understand what the hell is going on and why this person is jumping. And, and you try to get information, yet at the same time, actions are, are on, unfolding in front of your eyes. She jumped on the mic for a reason unknown. Uh, uh, she's not capable to transmit the right information or the information properly. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, probably to, to, to the great, great amazement of, of, of uh, Ziad Bibo himself, he's capable to get into a ministerial car that serve as cover, as a form of camouflage. Mm. And that's why he's cap capable to sort of go in front of the other police cars that are not surprised to see a ministerial cars like the hundreds, if not thousands, of cars that they've seen yeah. passing in front of them. The other the issue is there were so many police officers on the hill that day. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hannah and Evan, feel free to mm -hmm. jump in here, but there were some 300 police officers who deployed themselves, which indicates perhaps that there wasn't a plan. Oh, well, are those. Uh, a couple Sorry, go ahead, just Evan. jump. Let me just jump in, Hannah, on, on what um, Michaud said at this press conference. The, and the report does conclude this. I think we've got to really ask some serious questions. Michaud said, and I'll quote him, there's systemic flaws, not human error. In other words, there's a, and there's lots of nine, over 90 recommendations that they won't reveal to change the security protocols. But let's just remember, it is the RCMP who are responsible for what happens on the precinct before you enter those doors where it's mm -hmm. the parliamentary guards at that time. Now, why was it a systemic flaw, not a human error? 
the RCMP is supposed to identify someone. He'd already shot Cirillo at the war memorial. He yeah. run up with his gun. There was that RCMP officer. Yes, there was a woman with a baby carriage trying to get into the car. But if you look at that video, Carol, it's mm -hmm. like a slow motion chase following very closely. People say, oh, he had cover of a ministerial car. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't be saying there's a gunman in the car and the RCMP saying, well, we didn't know because it was a garbled message or, well, she wasn't sure who it was. That's why they didn't ram him. Okay. There's a real conflict, frankly, in the RCMP's own explanation as to why that car was not stopped more quickly and how Zihaf Bebo managed to penetrate into the building past the RCMP's jurisdiction. Frankly, those explanations contradict each other and they make no sense. Michelle, well, Evan, what do you think? Other, can, I just, uh, can I just get a response, uh, uh, Hannah, from sure. uh, Michelle to that particular point that Evan just made? Sorry, Anna. Uh, okay. I think in, the, in that perspective, one of the challenge uh, is definitely also at the 13th point of entry that uh, Mr. Michelle was referring to. This is where we miss the greatest opportunity to my point of view. Uh, I, I think the confusion that goes around when for a short period of time, 28 seconds, he entered the, 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 the site, gets into a car. That 28 second is where he is seen with a rifle, where he could be identified as a gunman walking in a place where he, sh he shall not. This is where we miss the real opportunity to my point of view. When he gets into the car, He's, he's, he's hiding, he's, he's difficult to identify to a certain extent. The police officer trying to communicate the information, that happened unfortunately, it's because again, we're talking about a very short period of time. I think if there was a focus that I was to be given, I would be given, gi giving the, pro, the, 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 the attention to those point of entry where there is a detection, and a detection should be, uh, and we have the technical capabilities, to bring that, that, that alert directly to the building, not necessarily relying on the visual connection or the visual identification of patrol officer that, as we've mm. seen, could be reading a report, could be sort of attending uh, a, a pedestrian, because here, this is the Parliament Hill, and we're at the Hill, and we're trying to keep a balance between accessibility to the general public within, without turning the, the mm. Parliament Hill into a Fort Knox. Well, that was, that, was, think... that was pretty much clear during, during uh, when we saw in these reports, and Hannah, I'll, I'll pitch this to you, is that, as I understand it, uh, there was a gathering of police officers outside the building they hesitated to go inside because uh, there is a rule about carrying arms inside the Parliament buildings. Well, that is in one of the uh, reports there. But I want to mention something that... I, I want to... Sorry, I just heard something in my no, ear there. No, go ahead. It's all yours, Hannah. I just want to long uh, mention one of the things <laughs> that uh, Michelle Juno Katsuyu was talking about. You've seen it in the video quite a few times where Michael Zihaf Bebo comes up onto Parliament Hill, and that's towards the East Block. Right across the street from there is the Prime Minister's office as well. When he comes up there, he fully has that gun in his hands. He's just been down at the Cenotaph, has shot off three separate shots and killed Corporal Cirillo at that time. When he arrives on the hill, there is not one RCMP officer at that first gate. The first gate, as you get onto the hill, that notifies anyone else that there is a man with a gun coming onto the hill. It's not until after he gets into the car and it's the car above it, closer to uh, the Parliament buildings itself, that's where the woman makes the RCMP officer aware that there is someone on the hill with a gun. So it seems like even at the first wall there, there was some form of penetration that maybe shouldn't have happened, that the RCMP didn't have their eyes out on that first wall. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, and Anna is right to point out also that just across the street, you have the building where the Prime Minister is. So this entire area should be highly surveillance, should be highly protected. And right there, when the three shots were, 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 were already fired at the Cenotaph, we should have somehow had a, a, a moment of detection that would have alerted everybody. And I think when Michaud talks about the systemic or the technical issues uh, that are lacking, this is one of the main aspects that is lacking. Absolutely, some of the procedures, I'm quite confident, has been revised since. Uh, 
to be frank, I am very, very confident that the security was fairly flawed in, on October 22nd. There was a lot of problem having a checkpoint inside the building in an era where uh, 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 terrorists don't hesitate to kill themselves at the same time with their bomb. This is like a huge mistake to put sort of the checkpoint right there. I think now, and I'm, I'm hoping, because we don't have all the details because of the operational and the, the confidential element, I hope that a lot of people have reviewed all those things and are about to change all those procedures. But definitely, that perimeter, that outside perimeters where Anna is talking about the, the one of the 13 point of entry, but that specific point of entry should have been watched or somehow mm. technically uh, 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 monitored differently than what we had now. Evan, since you've been covering for us the inside, I want to ask you this one final question. Does, do these reports call into question in any way the role of Kevin Vickers in the shooting? It's a really interesting question because of the, the amount of bullets fired. Um, they don't. They all say, the House of Commons has always said, and Vickers has never commented on it, that it was a team effort. Uh, Sam Aaron's son, the first parliamentary guard who, without armed, wrestled with Z.F. Bebo. The two other parliamentary guards that shot at one hit Z.F. Bebo in the hall going down. Uh, Vickers, according to the report, does jump, put himself in the line of fire, as it were, and fire up and, and shoot 15 shots in. And you could hear it on the video very clearly mm. when uh, Z.F. Bebo's last shot, Vickers, eight or nine shots, and then joined by the RCMP officer Barrett. It looks as if, when they do the actual forensic analysis of it, that they say uh, Z.F. Bebo's heart was beating the entire time un until the, the last shot, as it were. In other words, they never shot a dead man. They conclude he would have died from any number of these shots, two of them for sure, at least one that penetrated uh, into his heart and one to the back of the neck. So, no, uh, Vickers did his job. Barrett did his job. There's lots of questions about the trajectory of the bullets. If he was shot, you know, well, he was already down by the RCMP or up from Vickers, we don't have that ballistics report. Can I just say one other thing? Because, Carol, the, the country were really rallied around Corporal Nathan Cirillo, and, and one element of this report gives... It can only be described as graphic and emotional detail mm -hmm. of how Zehaf Bebo, uh, and I, the only word I can use is executed, uh, Nathan Cirillo. You know, we'd always thought it was two bullets and he'd shot from far away with his long gun rifle. Yeah. He, in fact, was 10 feet away. He walked up, he shot him in the back. Cirillo falls and starts to crawl. He shoots him again. And then he, and when, when Cirillo lies down, he, he literally shoots him again in the back and executes him. It was a stone cold murder there. And it's described in detail. And... And we hadn't heard that before. It's, it's, and I know I remember Hannah, you and I being there within mm -hmm. a minute on, on the War Memorial. It was a chilling moment. And, and if there's any doubt that this guy uh, was meant to kill, and, and even though he pointed the gun at others and, and didn't kill, at one point he said to the, the, the driver of the car he hijacked, get out of the car and I won't kill you. Mm. And so the guy does get out of the car. But he had an intent yeah. to kill, and, and, and that Cirillo moment is and chilling. Did he say mm -hmm. anything at the moment? Yeah, and I, and I have it here. Apparently, it says that as he was uh, shooting, he, he turns to his right, raises his right hand, and yells something similar to Iraq, okay. and then he leaves. And so, then on the inside, after, just before he dies, as I understand it, did he say something then? Yeah, it's it's unclear. In fact, there's there's Where there's some strange. At one point, as he's running in, one report said he said, "Have a nice day" to someone, and yeah, another was... one said he yelled in Arabic, "Hannah." Yeah, that was. I'm just looking at the page uh, to to help you out there. Um, when he was going in, uh, that was where he meets the first security guard, Samarin son, and another one. Uh, when he opened the door while entering the foyer, he yelled something similar to, uh, "Someone is going to get it today, or have a nice day, or get out of my way." So there, of course, there was a lot of confusion that was happening at that time. But there was also a tour group that was uh, coming out at that time it was I'm just going to take a look and to see exactly said, who it was, was he, he said mm -hmm. they heard the man with the gun yell some sort of war cry they say he believed it sounds something similar to Allah Akbar which means God is greater God is the greatest in Arabic uh, these okay. in Arabic yeah these were four bank employees who were coming out at the time so think of that too Carol
Carroll, he had the opportunity to take hostages on his way in because these people were just coming out at that time. He clearly had something in mind when he was going into the Hall of Honor. And then when they searched him at the end, this was just one other tidbit that we hadn't uh, known right. prior to this. Uh, he didn't have on any vest or any type of body armor. And then when they searched his pockets, he had two more cases, two more rounds in one pocket and two more in the other. And then there was one bullet on the floor that was no longer Okay. good so he did have more in his pocket all right the cbc's hannah thibodeau and evan solomon as well as security expert michelle juno katsua in ottawa i want to thank you all very much